Hello and welcome to another video here at the N10 Hockey Channel. Today we've definitely got a few things to talk about as we've got some major signings over in two Pacific Division teams, some more injury updates, a couple of minor trades that happened right before the trade freeze set in, and a trade rumor in Vancouver discussing who might be available there, and could we see expansion in the NHL's future? We'll get to all of that coming up right now. Hello and welcome to another video here at the Ensign Hockey Channel. I'd like to start off with a channel update, and that is that this is going to be my last video here in 2022. I want to thank everyone who has subscribed and liked my video. Your support really does help me do all of these videos, and I do really thank you for liking these videos and subscribing to my channel. But because Christmas is close and New Year's not too far away, I'm just going to be taking a two week break to sort of spend time with my family during the Christmas season and stuff like that. But don't worry, in the new year, we will definitely going to be doing more videos as the season will be getting really close underway and the trade deadline will not be too far away. So remember to keep an eye out for my next video, which will be in early January 2023. So that's the first thing I want to get to. Now over to some signings that have happened. In the NHL. Start with the LA Kings as the Kings have signed a top six forward Trevor Moore to a five year extension that has a cap hit of $4.2 million. Now, Trevor Moore has been an excellent forward for the LA Kings ever since being acquired by the Kings. He started his career off in Toronto, played a year and a half with the Maple Leafs, and then was traded to the LA Kings in the Jack Campbell deal, and he has played brilliantly for the Kings ever since. He had 23 points in 51 games in that shortened season, so that was his first really big step to becoming a prominent NHL forward because before that he was just a good bomb six forward. Last year he really broke out, putting up 17 goals and 48 points in 81 games with the LA Kings. And he played really well with line mates Deneau and Arvidsson, who were new acquisitions last offseason. So he did really well on that second line with Deneau and Arvidsson. Really completed that second line really well and Moore has been really going really well ever since. I know Arvidsson's had his fair share of injuries since the beginning of last season and Moore's still done really well. Even this year when Arvidsson's been out for a few games he's still been producing. Moore currently has 7 goals and 18 points in 34 games this year which is not half bad at all. So Game more signed is really good. There was a lot of talk in the last week or two that the Kings were working on an extension, so I don't think it's too much of a surprise that's gotten done right now. Four point two million is I'm not sure if it's a little bit too much. I probably would have gone three, three and a half for more, but still, more is a really good young forward and he's fit really well in that second line. So getting more locked up for the Kings is really good. He should be a good young piece for the next few years for the LA Kings as they continue to be a good strong team in the NHL. I still think that if they could just get that goaltending cleared up and have a little bit more solid goaltending night in night out, this team could be a very lethal team. So getting more signed is really good and it's going to allow them to keep one of their good top six forwards for the foreseeable future. And over in Edmonton, they had a signing as well as they signed backup goaltender Stuart Skinner to a three-year contract that will have a cap hit of 2.6 million per season. Now Skinner has done quite well. Up until last year, he had not played much time in the NHL. I think he only played one game. Then last year, due to some injuries with Koskinen and Smith, he got into a few games, and he did quite well. Having a 2.62 goals against average, and a 9.13 save percentage, and 13 games played. So he didn't play much. He was their third stringer last year. But when he did get into some games, he did look really good. And that gave the Oilers enough confidence to go and sign Campbell and promote Skinner from third stringer to backup. And... While Campbell has not done too well this year in his first season with Edmonton, Skinner's actually done quite well. In 19 games, he has a 2.83 goals against average and a 9.15 save percentage. So, somewhat similar numbers to what he had last year. A little bit worse goals against average, but better save percentage and more games. So, I guess that's a little bit more expected. And while Campbell's not done well, Skinner's actually done quite well. So, I would think that this moment with the way Campbell's playing, it's more of a 1A, 1B right now with Campbell still being the 1A. But Skinner's with the 1B, and he's showing that he can definitely be a backup. And if Campbell continues to fall, maybe even Skinner can show that he's starter-worthy. So I think that signing Skinner to a three-year $2.6 million deal is good. Getting him signed to $2.6 million is not too bad. I don't think, given what he's shown over the past two years, I think he can definitely be a $2.6 million goaltender. And given the fact that Campbell's had his struggles getting him signed for the next three years, 
it's pretty good for the Edmonton Oilers. So getting Skinner locked up for the next few years is good. And they're going to have a duo of Skinner and Campbell for the foreseeable future unless they end up trading one of them. But good signing for the Edmonton Oilers as they are able to lock up their backup goalie for the next few years. And hopefully Skinner can continue to play his pretty good play that he's shown over the past year and a half. That's all the signings we want to get to. Over to the injury update part of the video. As there have been a few injury updates over the past few days. Now I'm just going to go over some of these injury updates that have happened over the past three days. Uh, start with the Atlantic Division and Buffalo. The Sabres were able to activate Eli Bushkin off of injury reserve. He got into game action last night against the Vegas Golden Knights. Bushkin's a good third, second pair of four defensemen and can really play a good physical game. He doesn't put up too many points, but he's a good third pair defenseman, so getting him back is really good. I know that Buffalo had dealt with their fair share of injuries earlier in the year. Guys like Yoki Haru, Samuelson, Leah Bushkin, Darlene was injured for a little bit there, so they've had a lot of injuries on the blue line. They had been getting some of them back. We know that Yoki Haru is still injured for now, so getting Leah Bushkin back is good. He can easily just slot back into the top four with guys like Darlene and Power and Samuelson, and for the time being with Yoki Haru out, he can easily just slot back into the top six. So definitely good for the Sabres to get Leah Bushkin back. Over in Detroit, we saw that the Red Wings were able to get back Oli Mata from injury reserve. Now, Mata had only been on IR for like the last week. We talked about last week when he was placed in injury reserve and there wasn't really a definitive timeline. So getting Mata back was pretty good for the Red Wings. They have a little bit of injury troubles right now with some guys on the defensive end, like Mark Pissick and Robert Haig out right now. So getting Mata back is pretty good. I think he should be able to come back and be a good top four offenseman paired with Philly Bronick, like he has been over the course of the season so far, and should be able to continue to be a good top four defenseman for the Red Wings. So good to get Mata back for the Red Wings. Uh, not too much of a surprise, but over in Montreal, they had to place David Savard on injury reserve and he's going to miss the foreseeable future. Now, we talked about this last week, how Savard is going to be out three weeks with a upper body injury, and it did seem like he probably was going to get placed in injury reserve. It was just a matter of when, and that now they have done that. So he's probably going to miss another, like, two and a half, two weeks. Probably going to be out until early January, maybe closer to the middle of January would be my guess. So not too much of a surprise. Placing him in IR opens up a roster spot, which will be good for the Canadians to call up a player and maybe help with other injuries around the lineup, Get maybe call up like a forward or a defenseman. But not a surprising move for the Canadians to move David Savard on injury reserve. And also with the Canadians, Mike Matheson is currently dealing with a lower body injury and will be out for an indefinite period of time. So another defenseman going down to Montreal is not ideal. Not exactly sure the timeline for Matheson. It's just indefinite right now. So he's probably going to miss at least a couple of weeks and probably going to be out until January. So bad news for Matheson, but hopefully the Canadians can overcome these defensive injuries on the blue line. Over in the Metro Division, we'll start with Columbus as they continue to get bitten by the injury bug. Cole Sillinger missed yesterday's game with a minor injury and it's going to be out a few days, but the more significant one was Boone Jenner was placed in injury reserve and he's going to miss four weeks now with a thumb injury. Now, Jenner has been a really good top six forward for the Jaguars right now. He had mostly been centering the Goudreau line A line whenever they've been healthy. And he had done quite well, so losing to Jenner, who's a top six center, is not going to be good for the Jackets. He's going to be out until late January, maybe even early February, so not a good situation for the Blue Jackets to lose one of their top end centers. Hopefully Jenner can get back in the near future, but it's just another big blow to the Jackets forward group. Over in New Jersey, they sent Mackenzie Blackwood down to the AHL on a conditioning stint recently, called him up, and activated him. So Blackwood's now back to being a tandem with Vanacek in Jersey. It is really good for the Devils to get him back. He didn't do overly well to start the year, but then he had started playing well when the Devils were on their winning streak, and then he got injured. So getting him back is good. He's probably going to be a little bit rusty given the fact he's missed probably well over a month, maybe even a month and a half due to his injury. So he's probably going to need to get a few games back up to speed, but I think if he can continue to carry that success they had when the Devils were on their winning streak into game action right away, I think it's really possible that Blackwood is going to be a good backup goaltender behind Vanacek for the Devils, and he should be able to do quite well. Another goalie who's been activated is Washington Capitals goaltender Darcy Kemper. Kemper's missed about a week and a half with an injury. He was placed in IR earlier last week, so... 
Getting him back is really good. Lindgren, who is their backup, is an absolutely fantastic since Kemper's been out. But definitely think the game, their starting goaltender back is good. Washington's gone on a really good streak right now. They're winning a lot of games. And they've gotten themselves back in the playoff race. So hopefully the addition of Kemper to that lineup and their starting goaltender will be able to help them continue to push for a playoff spot. I know that they are really going hard to try and get, make the playoffs again. But we'll see if they can. But hopefully Kemper can be a big part of that. And over in Philadelphia, we got even more terrible news to the Flyers organization. As M. Atkinson is going to miss the rest of the season with a neck injury. Now, Atkinson had been an unhealthy scratch for basically the entire season since Game 1. He had just been on the roster, but just unhealthy and not being able to play. And now he's going to miss the entire season. So given the fact that Couturier is probably going to miss the season, if not, he's just going to be there for the last month or two. Uh, Ryan Ellis is going to miss the entire of the season. Now Atkinson's going to miss the entirety of the season too. It's just, it's not looking good for the Flyers. They're one of the lower teams in the league. They're the second lowest team in the East. They cannot win very many games right now, and they have a lot of injuries. So just another blow to the Philadelphia Flyers season. Hopefully Atkinson can make a good recovery and get back at the start of next season and help this Flyers team continue to be a good, strong team. Over in the Western Conference with the Pacific Division first, the Edmonton Oilers were able to activate Warren Fogel off of injury reserve, and he's going to be back now from his injury. You know, Fogel was also placed earlier last week on injury reserve, so not too much of a surprise he's back. I think with guys like Yamamoto coming back a little while ago, now Fogel, this offensive group is starting to get a little bit more healthier. They still have guys like Ryan McLeod and Evander Kane out, so that's still a little bit of a blow. But getting Fogel back was a good bomb six forward, can play in some fourth, third line roles, is really good, helps on the penalty kill too, so really good to get... Fogel back and help them get a little bit more depth into this lineup. Over in San Jose, they had an activation and a placement on injury reserve, as they were able to activate Matt Nieto off of injury reserve, but did place Luke Cunning. Now, Nieto has been there for the past few weeks, maybe even closer to a month, and he had done really well as a top 9 4 in San Jose this year. He's in the contract year, he's trying to show that he could be a good trade chip for the San Jose Sharks and go to a contained team and be a good middle 6, bomb 6 4 for a team. He's done really well. He's put up a lot of points, especially given the, his age and his role on the Sharks usually. And getting Neil back is going to be good, I think, that the Sharks are still doing okay, but they're not doing overly great, and they're one of the lower teams in the NHL. So getting a guy like Nieto back who could help with the goal scoring is going to really improve the Sharks' offense. As for Cunning, he's probably now going to be out for a season. They've said that he's going to be out with a knee injury for about six months. Now that puts us at around May, June, and I mean, if the Sharks were to maybe make the Stanley Cup Final, maybe he would get back in to the game action, but the Sharks are not going to make the Stanley Cup Final with the way they're playing and where they're at in the standings right now, so it's quite safe to say that kind of season is probably likely over for the Sharks. Not too bad of a first year, he's actually had quite a good season with the Sharks, but to have it end so soon is just awful for Luke Cunning. Hopefully he can get back into game action next year. Hopefully he can recover well from this knee injury and get back into game action. So it just really is bad for Cunning and the Sharks. And then over in Calgary, we, Chris Tanev was placed on injury reserve and he's going to miss some time due to an injury. Now we saw him take a puck to the face about a week and a half ago and he had missed a few games since then and now he's been placed on injury reserve. So given the fa that fact, I don't think it's too surprising that Tanev is going to be out for a while. There's no concrete timeline, but I'd say probably into the new year at the very least. Tanev did take quite a shot to the face and was on the ice for a little bit in last week's game against the Canadians. Tanev's actually done a really good job being a top four defenseman for Flames, and the Flames have done not too well without him. So hopefully Tanev can get back in the near future and continue to help the Flames playoff race as they could really use it. And a good defenseman like Tanev is really valuable in the NHL. Over into the Central Division, we have a few more injury updates. Uh, the Avalanche have activated Curtis McDermott off of injury reserve. That's a huge win for the Colorado Avalanche. McDermott has done really well as a third pair of defensemen. And the Avalanche are still dealing with a couple of injuries like a Samuel Gerrard or a Bowen Byram, or even a Josh Manson. So getting Curtis McDermott back is good. McDermott can play good third pair minutes. He's a good physical defenseman who can definitely be a reliable third pair defenseman. So getting McDermott back is good. He's not the biggest of activations for the Avalanche, but getting another healthy body 
is really good for the Avalanche, given the fact they're starting to get healthier, it's really good for the Colorado. As for Minnesota, they activated Ryan Hartman off of injury reserve. Hartman's missed a good couple weeks, maybe even closer to a month with an injury, and he's done quite well. He had a career season last year. He hasn't had that much of a production this year, but he's still putting up quite a bit of points, and getting him into game action is going to be good for the Minnesota Wild. And I think that getting him back into a middle six role where he can continue to produce and be a good winger or center, wherever they want to put him, is good. So getting Hartman back is another good forward they have. And as for the Jets, they had a few injuries that they're going to have to deal with. First, Blake Wheeler. He's been placed in injury reserve and will miss about the next month due to a groin injury. Now, Wheeler played through this in one of the Jets' last games. He stayed on the ice. He played as well as he could. And now he's going to be out for a month. So Wheeler has been a really big part of the Jets' top six this year, especially with the injury to Ehlers. He's really stepped up. And I think that losing him for a significant period of time is not good for the Jets. The Jets don't have the depth that other teams do, I think, on the forward group. So losing him is going to be awful. And hopefully the Jets can rely on some of these depth forwards for the time being, as losing Wheeler is not all that good. And then on the defensive end, they lost Nate Schmidt to an injury. He's going to miss six weeks with a shoulder injury. So... He's probably going to be out until mid-February, probably, around that time. Losing another good defenseman is not good for the Jets. They've already lost Logan Stanley. Uh, they've had some defensemen go in and out of the lineup due to injuries, too. So now losing Schmidt for a long period of time is not good for the Jets. So Schmidt, Wheeler are both out right now for the Jets. Hopefully they can count on their strong decor and whatever depth towards they can get to rise to the challenge as the Jets are really banged up right now and are hoping to continue to be a top three team in the Central Division. So that's all the injury updates I want to get to. Now yesterday the roster freeze kicked in. Before that there were two trades that happened. More minor trades but there were a couple. The first one was with between the Colorado Avalanche and the Toronto Maple Leafs. The Avalanche sent Dryden Hunt to the Toronto Maple Leafs in exchange for Dennis Mulligan. Now Mulligan has been a good forward for the Panthers and Maple Leafs. His first part of his career, he spent with the Florida Panthers. He did good. His best season was with the Panthers in 17-18 when he had 11 goals, 11 assists, and 22 points. But after that, he had done a little bit worse. He was then traded to Toronto. He played a little bit in Toronto. He then went and signed over in Europe for a couple seasons. He then came back to Toronto this year, and he only has two goals and four points in 23 games this year. So... He's been up and down the lineup. He's been a healthy scratch at some points for Toronto. He hasn't really found his key spot in the Toronto lineup. So giving him a fresh start to Colorado, I think is a good idea. The Avs still have some injuries. They have Landis Cog out, Helms out, McKinnon's out. There's still a couple of other guys who are out. So getting a guy like Malgan's good. Uh, he's not the best of fours, but he can be a good, decent bomb six forward. He's probably better than some of the guys who should be in the AHL right now, like a Ben Mayers or a sample Ranta or someone like that so I think he easily take a third or fourth line role for the Avalanche and in the right position I think he could still succeed I could still see Malcolm putting up at least 20 points in a season so hopefully the move to Colorado helps him out as for Hunt he has actually been moving around quite a bit this year he was started with the Rangers he was claimed off of waivers by the Avalanche He's been playing with the Avalanche ever since, and now he's being shipped off to the Toronto Maple Leafs. So I think that Hunt would be really good forward for the Maple Leafs. He's more like an Aston Reese who's already in Toronto. A good fourth line forward who's gritty and will really help the fourth line out a lot. And he can score on occasion. So last year he actually had his best season point-wise, putting up 6 goals and 17 points in 76 games with the New York Rangers. But this year he's only had 2 goals in 28 games with the Rangers and Avalanche combined. So definitely think that Hunt should be a really good forward with the Maple Leafs. I think Hunt can be a good fourth line forward with the Maple Leafs. While Malgan was bouncing around, I think Hunt can basically just stay as like a fourth line forward with maybe like a Zach Aston Reese. And those two can really do really good as the fourth line. And if Hunt and Aston Reese are playing with maybe like a Pierre Engvall on the fourth line, that's going to be a pretty scary fourth line to face. So definitely good move for the both sides. For the Leafs, they get a good fourth line grinding forward who can put up some points. For the Avalanche, they get a good speedy winger who can play third line minutes and hopefully produce some points. So good to opt for both. As for the other trade, it was a three-way deal between the Detroit Red Wings, Florida Panthers, and Anaheim Ducks. The Anaheim Ducks sent Dagny O'Regan to the Detroit Red Wings. The Detroit Red Wings sent Giovanni Smith to the Florida Panthers. And the Florida Panthers sent Michael Bilzotto to the Anaheim Ducks. So 
pretty good deals for all of them. I think Detroit is probably the team who comes away probably the worst. They had a good depth forward in Giovanni Smith, who was playing good AHL minutes, and could have come up if they had ran into some more injury trouble. They get O'Regan, who's not a bad forward. He does have 30 NHL games in, under his belt. He does have 6 points, but over the past 3-4 years, he hasn't really played much in the NHL, and has been more of an AHL forward. Currently this year having 3 goals and 18 points in 27 games with Anaheim's AHL affiliates, so he should go to Detroit and be a good depth forward. I think if there was a few more injuries, he could still be called up and be a good fourth line forward, but definitely think that Oregon's going to be more of an AHL forward with Detroit, especially with Detroit's depth. Once they get a little bit more healthier, he's going to fall down the depth charts. Over in Anaheim, they give away O'Regan, who was a good forward, who could have gone in the bottom six, but was more of an AHL forward. They get Michael Lozado, who they have definitely have familiarity with. He was with the Ducks a couple of seasons ago for a season and a half. Uh, Delzato's been a good for some of the teams. He's definitely been around a few teams. He's played in Philadelphia, he's played in Vancouver, Anaheim, New York Arch, name a few. So I definitely think Delzato could be a good fit in Anaheim. He had signed a one-year deal with the Panthers, hoping that he could probably get a third-pair role. He ended up starting in the minors. He's been there ever since. Only has two goals and 10 points in 25 AHL games this year, so I would expect Lozado to probably most likely be in the AHL, but given the fact that we've seen the Ducks really banged up on injury at some points in this year, I mean, at one point they had Nathan Boyle, John Klingberg, uh, Kevin Shattenkirk, uh, Jamie Drysdale, Erho Vanakainen out, so they had a lot of injuries. So getting a depth piece like Delzado, just in case you do run into a few more injuries like that, is probably a smart move by the Ducks, and I think they could really benefit from it. As for the Panthers, I think they got the best deal. Uh, they moved on from Michael Lozado, who was not getting any NHL time, so not too surprising. They still also had guys like a Lucas Carlson and Matt Kirstead ahead of him, so it's not too surprising to see that them moving on from Michael Lozado. And they were able to get Giovanni Smith. Now, Smith is a good fourth-line grinder. He was in the AHL because the Red Wings have a really deep team right now. And I think in Florida, he could definitely be a good forward. We know that the Panthers are dealing with a couple of injuries right now to guys like Alex Barkov and Anton Lundell. And there have been other guys who have gone in and out of the lineup due to injuries. And they've had to use a couple of guys like uh, Alexi Haponiemi or a Grigory Denisenko in the NHL uh, fourth line. And I think that Heponiemi and Denisenko should be playing more AHL minutes to continue their development, especially Denisenko, who I think is a good top six forward of the future. So getting Smith, he should be able to be placed right into the lineup. I think of the three, he's the most likely to get into NHL action. Smith can be a good fourth line forward. He's sort of like a Ryan Longberg, who they already have in here, a good checking forward who can play really well on the fourth line and put up some points. Last year, he did really well with the Red Wings having four goals and seven points in 46 games. But given the fact they had a lot more depth this year, he was bumped down the depth charts, and now he's with the Florida team, who I think, given the fact that they don't have too much really NHL-level depth, I think Smith could definitely be one of the first few call-ups if there are injuries. And considering there are injuries right now, I could see Smith maybe getting some NHL time right away. So those are two trades that happened before the freeze. Now let's go over to the trade rumor part of the video. Now to start with, the, the Vancouver Canucks are apparently not looking to do a rebuild right now, and they're only untouchable as Elias Pettersson. Now I think this is a little bit of a surprise. First, I do think that maybe going in a rebuild is the direction they should be going. They've lost back-to-back -back games 5-1 to one to the Blues and the Jets, so it's not been an ideal run for the Vancouver Canucks over the last little bit, and they're not doing too well. It seems like almost anyone is available, and while Quinn Hughes is available, they said it would take one extremely huge package to pry Hughes away from Vancouver. I still think that Hughes is probably going to stay with the Canucks and Patterson is also probably going to stay with the Canucks and I think that some other guys are probably going to have to move. In my opinion, I still think that Besser being moved is a very good possibility. So is Connor Garland. I think Horvat is pricing himself out of Vancouver and he's probably going to be moved too. And I think that maybe a guy on the blue line too, like a Tyler Myers, even if it's in the off season, there's probably a good light chance to be moved. I think there's a lot of guys there who could be moved. The fact that I don't want to go through a full re rebuild is a little bit surprising to me. I think given how they've played this year, it might make sense to go through a full rebuild. But they don't seem to want to. So whether it be just trading some good guys for other good guys, like a Besser for another good forward, or a Horvat for another good forward, or whether it be training them for picks and prospects and using some of those picks and prospects to acquire another good forward, it 
does seem like the Canucks may be willing to do that a little bit more than just going through a rebuild. I still think they should try and tank as much as they can, try and get a good draft pick this year, maybe retool a little bit in the offseason, and then go after some guys. I mean, if they could get like a good couple of pieces for guys like a Horvat or a Besser or a Garland, and then go out in free agency, maybe sign a good forward or a defenseman, or maybe go and make a trip with some of the picks and prospects they just got, maybe that would make more sense. But I definitely think that there's not a lot of untouchables right now in Vancouver, and they could be one of the busier teams we see before the trade deadline. I think Horvath could easily be moved. Besser's a likely candidate. Uh, definitely think that Garland, Myers could be moved. Shen, if they don't feel like they could resign him. So I definitely think that there's a couple of guys in Vancouver who are probably going to be moved right now. I would say probably not Quinn Hughes, even though he's not listed as an untouchable. But definitely think that whether it be via rebuild or via just swapping some players, this Canucks core is going to be shaken up and be, going to be shaken up a lot in the next few months before the trade deadline, and then probably in the off season. Now to the last thing I want to discuss in this video: Could we see more expansions by the NHL in the future? Now I don't think it's anywhere imminent, but I did see a few articles over the past few weeks, as well as something that Chris Johnston and Elliot Friedman have said. And that is that we could see the NHL expand in the future. Now, Johnston said that he wouldn't be surprised if, not right now, but in a year or two, we could be talking about expanding beyond 32 teams. And while Freeman was just throwing it out there, he said, with the pandemic hitting and a lot of the teams losing revenue due to the fact they weren't able to get fans in the stands during that shortened season and stuff like that, and the fact that Vegas and Seattle, the two most recent expansion teams, are two of the top teams in revenue, it may make sense for the NHL to expand to try and get some more revenue. Now, I do think that expanding to 33, 34, 36 teams is a possibility. I know I have liked expansion. I was not around for the expansions of teams like the Panthers or the Bolts or the Senators. So I never really saw all those expansion teams. But I did watch closely the Vegas Golden Knights and Seattle Kraken expansion draft, and I really do like the expansions. I do like seeing the expansion teams, their highs and their lows. I think that adding Vegas and Seattle, even though it was just to balance with the conferences, was a good thing for the NHL. And I could see them expand to maybe 34 or 36 teams. Now, I think this is just my opinion. There has been definitely no talks about this, but this is just my opinion. I wouldn't expect any expansions for the next three to four years. I think first they have to get the Tempe situation in Arizona figured out. And that's going to be still a little bit. I think they're leaning more towards yes, but it's not definite yes yet. So they need to get that Tempe situation locked up. And then Arizona's going to be staying in Tempe for the foreseeable future. And the NHL's CBA is also going to be expiring in 2026. So I don't think they want to have an expansion draft by the time the NHL and NHLP are talking about a new CBA. Because I don't think they want to have an expansion that could be delayed due to a possible lockout. And in previous CBA discussions, we have seen that there is a lot possibility of a lockout. So I don't think they would see anything before the season of 2026. But after 2026, maybe in the 2027, 28, 28, 29, 29, 30 season, maybe we see an expansion. I think it's quite possible. Now, in my opinion, the most likely expansion team would be Houston. Now, Houston has expressed interest in trying to acquire an NHL team. They'd be good rivals for the Dallas Stars. They have an NHL-ready arena. The Houston Rockets, which is an NBA team's owner, has said that he would love to bring an NHL team to Houston. And it would really be a good addition to the NHL, given the fact that Houston is one of the bigger markets in the U.S. So I think if they were to expand, bringing a team to Houston is probably the most likely possibility. I think most people would say that if the NHL were to expand to any city, it would probably most likely be Houston. In my opinion, I think they should bring two teams in in an expansion draft to still keep the conferences balanced. There's like 17 in the East, 17 in the West. And I still think they should go to Quebec. I think while the NHL doesn't seem like they want to go to Quebec and the Canadian dollar is making it really hard for a team to go to Canada right now, I still think that going to Quebec might be the right thing. If you look at all of the possible Eastern Conference sites that could maybe host an expansion team, I think Quebec is the most NHL ready city who could have an expansion team. I mean, they have an NHL type arena. They have some people who could be interested in getting an NHL team. I know it's a little bit more expensive in Canada, and I think that it will be a little bit more difficult, but I think 
given all the people who want to see another team in Quebec, I mean, when Arizona was first announced that they wouldn't be returning to Glendale and there was a lot of people who thought that they could be relocated, the two teams who I've seen a lot of people mention who could probably be most likely cities that the Arizona Coyotes could relocate to was Quebec and Houston. And I think those two are the most likely to get an NHL expansion team. I know Quebec still, Canadian dollars not working for them and the NHL might not want to come to Canada again and it might be a little more sense to have a team relocate to Quebec instead of giving them an expansion team. But I still think bringing back the Nordiques would be a good move by the NHL. I still think that having the Nordiques back in the NHL would be really good. So hopefully they can get Quebec, Quebec in the NHL. That's just my opinion. But I still think that if they were to have an expansion draft, they would have two teams and maybe 28, 29, 29, 30. And maybe have like a Houston in the West, Quebec in the East, in my opinion. That's just my thoughts, but definitely think that. And then maybe five or six years down the road, maybe they bring another two teams and bring the NHL to a complete 36 teams. Maybe 18 teams in the East, 18 teams in the West. I definitely think there are some other possibilities besides Quebec and Houston who could be expansion teams. And I've seen a lot of people mention a couple of different cities. I know Portland might be one. They host a WHL team, so they could be a good thing. Uh, Kansas City, they have have an NHL-ready arena. Casey also had an NHL team. While Casey did have some trouble getting fans to the arena, I think Casey could be a really good expansion team, maybe making a natural rivalry with the Blues. Uh, Regina could be another team. I know getting another team in Central Canada could be another team. I know, once again, the Canadian dollar is probably going to be holding that up. But maybe getting a rival with the Jets would be good. Uh, so those three could be good. I know I've also seen some mention Salt Lake City or Oklahoma City or San Diego. I think those three are probably a, lot, a little bit less likely, but I could see eventually a team in maybe a Regina, a Casey, a Portland, and also Milwaukee in the West. I think Milwaukee could also be another city who could host an NHL team. I know they have still a little bit of work to do with like, their NHL arena and stuff, but they'll make good rivalries with teams like the Chicago Blackhawks, Minnesota Wild, and Detroit Red Wings. So I definitely think that there could be some appetite to go to Milwaukee as well. I think there's definitely a few teams out West. In the East, there's a little bit less... Pl- cities who I think have as much of a likelihood as cities in the West, but I do think could we see maybe a return of the Atlanta? I think it's very unlikely, but they've already gone to Atlanta twice with the NHL, with the Atlanta Thrashers and the Atlanta Flames. Could they go a third time? It's possible. Uh, You got Hartford. Could they go back and make another Hartford team? I think it's another possibility. Uh, Baltimore, I know they're a little bit too close to Washington, but I think they could be another possibility. Uh, Could you go to Cincinnati or Cleveland? I know it's maybe not the most likely possibility, but it would definitely make a Battle of Ohio with Columbus so really interesting. Uh, You've got another city like maybe a Hamilton in Ontario. I know they're a little bit too close to a team like Toronto and Buffalo, and they wouldn't really like that. But I've seen Hamilton mentioned enough that I think it's still a possibility. Uh, Maybe a Halifax team. I know some people... A maritime team would be good. I know Halifax is a little bit out there, but I think that even though the Canadian dollar would be hard for, say, like Hamilton or Halifax to get an NHL team, I do think it's still a possibility. So I definitely think there's a handful of cities who could host NHL teams in the future. I think we're probably not going to see anything for the next four or five years at the very earliest. But eventually, I do think we could see more NHL expansions. I think if we were to, it would be Houston first. Maybe Quebec, if they can maybe work out some way to get themselves back into the NHL. And then after that, you got a lot of possibilities. KC, Portland, Milwaukee, Regina, Salt Lake City, OKC, uh, San Diego, uh, Hamilton, Halifax, Baltimore, Hartford, Atlanta. There's definitely a lot of possibilities, but I would like to know what you think. Do you think we will see any NHL expansions in the near or far future? If so, when do you think they could happen? And cities do you think would be given NHL teams? That's all I'm going to talk about for today. I hope everyone has a very Merry Christmas for whoever celebrates it. And everyone has a Happy New Year. I will probably not be doing much of anything. I may do a blog post or two if there's something big that happens between the end of the roster freeze and my next video in early January. I think it's possible. But just keep a lookout for my next video. Remember to like this video and subscribe. I also do a blog, which I will leave the link to in the description below, and check that out just in case you do end up posting something before my next video. I can't wait to see you guys all in 2023 for my next video. Merry Christmas, Happy New Year, and I'll see you guys soon.